Good morning, Thursday morning, and uh, here we are again, and Deb's back at work uh, and doing her thing. Uh, I appreciate Emily doing a devotion yesterday morning. Uh, now, as we think about uh, something that maybe you're not going through it, but I'm thinking there's a lot of people that perhaps are, um, just the idea of being tired, tired of all of this. I I'm ready to be done with it. I saw on the television this morning where there were people that are renting RVs just to get out of the house and they're putting their home on the mobile wheels. They're heading across the country. And I thought, wow, that sounds like something I'd like to do. If you're going to quarantine me, quarantine me in the Grand Canyon or quarantine me on the beach, uh, give me some wheels where I can decide where I want to be quarantined at. Well, that's, that's, that's a good idea. And they say that the uh, rental market for RVs is just going bananas right now. Um, so anyway, I wanted to talk about that this morning. Uh, before we do, I, I talked to Missy. Some of you are, I'm sure, concerned about how Alva's going to do and, and what's going on with her today. And uh, Polly is our kind of our point person on that. Uh, also, Kathy Torres. So I'll be listening to them that way. Uh, I and others, I guess, won't be bombarding Missy with a, a lot of uh, phone calls or stuff. Or we can, of course, definitely send text messages of encouragement. That would be great. But the plan is Alva and Missy will be at the hospital at 11 o'clock this morning. And then based upon how Alva's blood count in all is doing, they'll proceed from there. We can pray that her blood uh, you know, count will be good that, you know, this is a surgery that has been talked about different, many different times in the, in the former uh, times. Last time I was at the hospital with them, I, I remember the doctor saying there are two blockages and we're going to try to go and take care of both of them. Uh, they did the one and decided not to do the other. The other was the blockage that was there the time before that. And the doctors at that time said they didn't want to take a risk. Uh, to get into that. And so this is the one, it's almost like the big kahuna. It's the blockage that, man, if they can get that taken care of it, I think it's going to set Alva many uh, years ahead, you know, with, so we'll just pray. And, and then uh, you might have seen where Cassie posted uh, that Cassie and Armando's son, Julian, was taken to the emergency room yesterday they diagnosed him with pneumonia, but pneumonia is a part of having the COVID-19. And um, that whole household, it says Armando's doing better, Cassie is having a hard time. And I think that's what we understand about this virus is that it's uh, unpredictable. You really don't know how it's going to affect you. Most people are going to be just about scot-free. But a wise man considers the full picture, and is cautious. And that's what I encourage you to do. Don't get caught up in all of these stories about, you know, this and that. And uh, a wise man doesn't pay attention to speculation at all. The Bible says speculation gives rise to strife. It just makes people argue. No sense in that. What we need to do is, what is the knowledge? Well, one of the big knowledge factors is there's a lot we don't know. It affects people differently and it can be very fatal and it is very contagious. So it's the world we live in, but uh, we just have to remember we've got Jesus with us. So we need to pray for Alva. We need to pray for Julian and for Cassie and Armando that they will continue getting well and there's others that we're praying for. Margie, I talked to her yesterday, and she seems to be doing better, and she she shared that with me. So Margie, we'll just pray that uh, you'll continue to, to get better and to get well. Um, and Terry, I haven't talked to you in a while. I, I'm hoping that your knee is progressing and, and getting well, uh, and I need to give you a call today to see how things are going. Wow. Well, let's... Uh, and you know, right now, the Lord knows what's in your heart. God knows everything about you. 
God knows what's going on with everybody in our church. So let's just pray to him and ask his blessings, his healing, his comfort. Father, we bow our heads before you, knowing that you are our great God and you are our true physician. Father, you can give the word and sickness stops in its track. Father, I just pray that, Lord, if you will, that your favor would be upon Alva today. And Lord, if it can be your will, we just pray for this stent surgery to happen. And Lord, we pray that it would happen and you would cause it to happen successfully. Lord, you know that Alva and Missy are just trusting in you. And Father, we pray for Cassie and Armando and Julian be with this household. Help us to know, Lord, the lessons you're wanting all of us to understand as we see this sickness take place right in front of our eyes. We don't have to depend on speculation and what other people are thinking or saying. Help us to see the reality of this, that we might simply be careful and consider our steps and be cautious wise. And Lord, for Margie and for Terry Pomeroy, others, Lord, that are needing your healing, Father, I pray that you'll be with them. Lord, we even remember Patty and Patty's mom as they're dealing with her during these days. And Father, for each of us, that you would fill us with your strength and especially your joy and that your word would speak to us today. In Jesus' precious name we pray. And God's people said, amen. And MJ, not to neglect mentioning your cousin Delana and praying that her uh, health is returning and she's doing well with her new heart. So, um, you know, joy and happiness. Yeah, those are the things that God wants us to have. It's the intention of God's plan and purpose for us. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and to have it abundantly. And so it's something God wants. But you know, sometimes you get tired. You ever been just tired? And, and my, you know, my grandmother would have a term. She would say, I'm all stove up. I didn't exactly understand what stove up meant until I saw a pot belly stove and I saw the exhaust pipes or whatever you call them coming up off of it and going through the wall. And it's just a bunch of series of pipes, but they're stuck together. They're curved in different angles, but they're stuck together. And that's, I guess what she was saying. I'm all stove up. It's like, I can't move my joints. Maybe that's what she was trying to say. But we get tired, not just physically, but we get tired emotionally. It's like, I'm tired of dealing with this, you know, um, and we can give a lot of reasons for that. We get tired spiritually. I mean, even I, in thinking about a devotion and thinking, do we need to talk about the great sins of America and the need for repentance? Yes. Do we need to talk about the judgment of God and how serious that is? Yes. But do we also need to talk about the children of God? and the comfort, and the peace, and the joy that God can give us, even in difficult times. And there was a resounding yes as I thought about that, because we really want to hear from the Lord. And I am sure, just like any parent, you don't want to spend your time just disciplining your children. There's a time for discipline, but there's also a time to just have joy, to enjoy one another and be stronger and, and, and be happy. And so, you know, there there is a verse that has popped up on my Bible app almost every morning. It's like it comes around every three days. And I've noticed there, I've said a few things about it before, but it's like a fresh look at what it's saying. And, you know, God was doing that to me. And um, it's in Hebrews, and it's interesting 
because you know I like to understand why a book or a letter was written. And it is pretty clear why Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, was written. Hebrews was written because Christians were having a hard time. So the whole book of Hebrews is, is to Christians. They were not just having a hard time. They were shying away from living their testimony openly in front of others. They were being persecuted. And the people that, that this letter was written to are Christians who were beginning to shy away from being public about their Christianity. That was during the time that uh, Christians were being persecuted. And perhaps during the times that, you know, all these, uh, uh, you know, people like Paul were out dragging Christians out of their homes and throwing them in jail and Christians began to leave Jerusalem. At first, it was a big thing. Everybody came to Jerusalem because of the great Pentecost uh, experience. And that's where Jesus was. That's where the disciples were. But now they've been dispersed. They're having a hard time. They're scattered. They've left their homes, left their friends, and they're picking up the pieces wherever they are. And some of them have decided, I'm just going to try to, you know, blend back in with society. And I'm a Christian, but I'm not going to, you know, uh, do it in such a way that it's going to bring me problems. They were having difficult times. And in Hebrews, Towards the end, we have one of the most beautiful instructions of Scripture where the writer has just finished a whole chapter in 11 about the faith. All the people that, and I think Debbie talked about this, the people that believed in God, they had such a faith in God, trying to encourage these folks, don't give up. But anyway, back, back to where we are. In chapter 12, you know, in verse one, it talks about all the, you know, witnesses that are around us, people that have gone through life already, and now they're in heaven. And they're looking on and they're saying, hey guys, you can do this. And, and, and it's in the picture of a race where, you know, as believers, we're in this race and it calls it a run with endurance, a race with endurance. It's a race where, yeah, you really want to get off the track. You really want to stop. You're getting tired. You're getting weary. And man, you'd like to just say, okay, I'm over it. I'm not into this anymore. And so the, the writer in verse one, it says, hey, there's a big group of people that have lived their Christian life. They've gone through difficult times and they're cheering you on. You're, you're not by yourself. The things you're dealing with, your sense of being tired and losing hope and just getting emotionally weary is saying, hey, look, other people have been through this pathway already and they're in heaven. You know, we have a great cloud of witnesses that they're surrounding us. So it's like the people on the side of a race and they're encouraging the runners, keep going, you got it, you got this. And, and then it says that we need to run with endurance. So how does joy come into that? Well, then the spotlight goes off of all of these runners. Then the focus is off of all these people that are around you saying, go for it. And the spotlight goes on to Jesus. And it's going to give you a picture of the joy that Jesus had. And there's three reasons or three aspects of that joy. And we're going to look at that. And, you know, it says, fix your eyes on Jesus. During times when it's difficult, that's all the more important to think about Jesus. Look at Jesus. Fix your eyes don't, don't think about how tired you are. Try not to think about, you know, the difficulties, but just fix your eyes. Look at Jesus. And it says he's the author and perfecter of our faith. He's the one who is the reason that we're running the race. 
He's the reason that I'm a Christian because of him. So look back at him. And then it, it's going to give us an insight that to me is kind of the message almost of this entire book. The joy set before him, he endured the cross. Well, one of the things that I see that gave Jesus joy, he had a purpose. It was set before him. Jesus lived his life on this world with a single purpose of doing what he had come to do die on the cross, and pay for my sins. For you and I to have a stronger joy in life, we have to remind myself and yourself, we have a purpose. Our purpose is to run this life, to bring joy to the Lord, to add our testimony to the testimony of all these other people that have been saved, it says a great cloud of witnesses. That is, a witness has a testimony. People in heaven are saying, this is my testimony. I ran for Jesus. It was set before me. I have a purpose. And so I'm realizing that for me to not give up, for you and, and I to deal with those times that we get so tired of doing this, we have to remind ourselves, what is our purpose? My purpose is the run with endurance. My purpose is set before me, which is to live a testimony of this is what it looks like to run for Jesus. This is what it looks like to be able to say, thank you, Lord, for dying for me. I've got a purpose and it's the run, this race with endurance. And it says that Jesus, because of the joy set before him, endured the cross. The second thing about having joy is that joy helps you endure. Joy helps you keep on keeping on. And it's saying, look at Jesus. He endured the cross because of the joy that was set before him. I cannot imagine what it would be like to be hanging my flesh on nails and to endure that pain. I cannot imagine what it would be like for somebody to take my feet and drive a nail through my feet and to have to endure that pain for minute after minute after horrible minute and to feel the flesh in my arm and my hands or my wrists wherever that nail was to just feel the flesh tearing and lay and be there enduring the pain and what that does for me, it, it, it says, wow, it's almost like, a, almost like a pleasure to be able to endure something because of Jesus, because of what he endured for me. And so my purpose of being a testimony, the purpose that is set before me, which is I want to be a testimony to how much I love Jesus, then that helps me endure. That helps me say, this is part of my testimony. It's hanging in there to the end. Run that race with endurance because the spotlight is on Jesus, how he endured for me. My joy is because I have a purpose and my joy helps me endure. And the third thing about joy, when you look at Jesus, his joy had a destiny. Not only, number one, did it have a purpose. Number two, did it, did it give him endurance? 
But number three, his joy had a purpose. It says, you know, consider him. He endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus knew that as he endured that cross, his destiny was going to be able to sit down, to sit down right there by the throne of God. And that's the third thing that should strengthen our joy. That emotionally when we get tired, physically when we get tired, oh, I wish this was over with, we will say. But I can endure because there's a lot of people and their testimony is already set. And now I have a purpose, my testimony, and I can endure because number three, I have a destiny. I'm not running this race in vain. I'm not doing these things without cause. No, I have a reason because the day will come that I, praise God, will be able to sit down in the peaceful, loving, all-provisional kingdom of God. God would say, enter my rest. And so these things are sweet. Yes, the pain was excruciating to Jesus, but he could look past the pain to that moment he could say, into your hands I commit my spirit. And folks, the day will come when you and I will be able to say those same words, Lord, into your hands I commit my spirit. Isn't that going to be great joy because your heart is fixed on a destiny, the right hand of the throne of God? And verse 3 sums it up. Consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. Jesus is said had a purpose in everything he was going through so that you and I, when we go through whatever we have, will not grow weary. We will not lose hope. We will not uh, lose heart. You know, that's a twofold thing. Grow weary and lose heart. We're going to get tired. We're going to grow weary. But God says, I don't want you to grow weary and lose heart. And so when we're tired, rest. When we're exhausted, turn it over to God. When you're worried, let God handle those things. Take in a deep breath and get up and run the race again tomorrow. Do with whatever strength God gives you for that day. And when you get to the end, take those moments when you just need to sit down and, you know, rest and get that drink of cold water and that read, reading of some scripture of that moment, soaking in the beauty of this world. Keep replenishing yourself with all the things God gives you every day for your rest. But when you get to the place where you're saying, I am so tired of this, how long am I going to have to deal with this? Then remind yourself of your purpose. You're living a testimony for God. Set that in front of you. Keep going for that. That will help you endure. And then remember your destiny. Remember where you're headed. You're going to see Jesus the one who ran the race ahead of you so you would not grow weary and lose heart. I hope this has been a strength for you. God intends for us to have joy. God intends for us to be overcomers. And so I know this has blessed me. Can you just bow your heads with me and let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for what you've done. 
And Lord, help us to do as your word instructs us to, fixing our eyes on Jesus. And that Lord, that whoever is listening to this, if they're dealing with things, and we all are in certain ways, I'm sure, where we're tired of doing some of the things we are, Lord, give us an extra breath. Give us an extra strength. May the wind and the cool breeze of your Holy Spirit refill us with a new sense of purpose in what we're doing, a new sense of a destiny of where we're going, and a new sense of endurance of what we're going to do until we get there. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I hope you've enjoyed this. I, I keep saying that because there's many times when I look into God's word and he just blesses my heart. And this is one of those. And so uh, good day to you. Hope you have a good Thursday. Bye-bye.